and I'm going to start by introducing Sigrid Bothan, who is a luminary of Renaissance Society. She has she spent 13 years with the Sacramento Bee, 32 years uh, teaching journalism and other subjects here on the Sac State campus. She has written extensively about mental health issues. Um, she is really very well known for that. She was media director for the Fair Political Practices Commission and also press secretary to both the superintendent of public instruction and the attorney general. So she has she has a wonderful career and she's also a compatriot because she grew up in Chico, California. So yes. <laughs> so uh, Sigrid, it's a pleasure to have you and you will introduce our speaker. sure to turn all of this over to Randall and just guide the discussion. Guide the discussion. Excuse me. I need to speak into the mic. Um, Randall Hager has been in the forefront of major mental health policy and legislation in California for decades as the father of a severely mentally ill adult son and longtime legislative advocate for California psychiatrists. He has deep knowledge of both family struggles and the complex intricacies of mental health policy. He represents the Psychiatric Physicians Alliance of California and actively advises community groups, families, and legislators, and has helped write much of California's major mental health legislation. He holds a bachelor's degree in behavioral health from the University of California, Davis. He has long been involved with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, which advocates for family members, served on the statewide board of directors and was president of the Sacramento chapter. He also serves on the national board of the Treatment Advocacy Center in Washington, DC, which is long re which researches and advocates for mental health reform. He twice was a co-convener convener of the statewide LPS reform task force to advocate for major reform of the 1967 Latterman Petrus Short Act, which is governed mental health policy in California for nearly 60 years. Many of the task force recommendations have been enacted into law. With intense public and legislative interest in mental health and related issues, dozens, dozens of bills affecting a wide range of state and local mental health services have been debated in the state legislature in recent years and Governor Gavin Newsom has made mental health and homelessness his signature issues. Considerable recent legislation has been passed with strong bipartisan support, often unanimously. For policymakers, journalists, and family members attempting to get help for seriously mentally ill relatives, Randall has long been an invaluable source of knowledgeable, thoughtful, and understandable analysis of mental health and related issues homelessness, substance abuse, incarceration. His own family's experiences inform his work, and as a result of his advocacy and that of other family members who are for too long have been kicked to the curb in policy discussions, families now have increasing influence on policy. Um, I did a lengthy interview. Randall's been a lo long time invaluable source for many of my articles. There's a series on the Capital Weekly website and on my own website, which is Sacramento, which is SigridBothan.com. And I did an extensive in-depth interview with Randall for a QA. and a um, And you can find that on my website and on this Capital Weekly website. Capital Weekly is an online nonprofit news service, which gives me hope for the future of journalism in the nonprofit sector. Um, and um, it's a really important series that we've been doing. I started covering mental health at the B. Uh, gosh, I was in my 20s and the 70s, terrible conditions in the state mental hospitals. And it's a direct line to what we're seeing on the streets today. But I want to leave that discussion to uh, to Randall. So thanks so much for coming. And here's your question. Testing. Okay, got it. You can hear me in the back, right? Yep, no, okay, that's better. Okay. 
it feels like I'm going to eat it, but we're, we're, I'm not going to. Yeah, I got to hold it right here, though. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, gosh, where to start? There's a lot of things I could tell you, but uh, let, let me just start with this. Um, and Sigurd has mentioned this. As, uh, you know, I visited my son this week. He has schizophrenia. He's here um, in a conservatorship in Sacramento. Okay. I don't know if you guys swap microphones because this one is actually better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the better allowed. Test, 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 oh, okay. Test. All right. There you go. I can almost yell that loud, but not quite. So um visited my son. Uh he's here in Sacramento. He is has schizophrenia. Uh he's grown up here, was diagnosed here. Uh he's in a locked facility, has been for close to three years, and he's conserved. Um and, um, you know, it's been a long, hard journey with him because when he gets out on the street, uh, he often tends to run away, um, tends to sleep on the street. Uh, he panhandles, he sells his clothes. Um, he tries to find meth when he can. And he basically decompensates. Uh, how many people here know what decompensates mean, right? Okay, gets into very, very bad shape with high symptoms, right? Uh, strong uh, symptomatic psychosis. And um, when I first, with, with, with his first diagnosis, um, I, I'd been having trouble for a long time. And what I wanted to do was to find a solution and find an answer why he was being so problematic. Of course, teenagers are and can be very difficult to deal with. You know, some people have called uh, uh, teenager who had kind of a kind of psychosis in itself. But and, and their mental health diagnoses are often made in late adolescence or early. 20s. Yes. And in this case, he was um, 15 years old. He ran away, uh, been gone about three weeks. I got a call in the middle of the morning, like 3 a.m., uh, from a police officer at Humboldt State University saying he'd been found up there talking crazy and scaring the girls in the girls' dorm. And please come and pick him up because he'd been taken to the um, treatment center, or the emergency crisis center there in Eureka, and come pick him up. So I went up there and um, you know, got in a, actually had to borrow a car at that time. Imagine trying to do that at four in the morning, but drove up met with the doctor. The doctor said, I've given him a shot. He's really sick. And now I want you to drive him back to Sacramento and I want you to get him in the hospital. So I drove to our facility down here on Stockton Boulevard and um, I presented him and I thought, oh my God, you know, I've just spent seven hours in the car with a psychotic individual who's babbling and not talking nonsense. And I was afraid he was just going to open the door at 70 miles an hour and just jump out. And so you can imagine my anxiety. Um, and I thought, okay, it's over. He's now safe. Doctors will take care of him. Hospital will take him in. But no, they wouldn't do that. And that was my first experience with our Lanterman Petra Short Act laws. And I wanted to learn more about them after I finally did get him hospitalized. I, I never knew about uh, 5150s to any great degree, didn't know that it was danger to self, danger to others, grave disability. And if you could prove that, you could get some help. And if you couldn't, you wouldn't. And so I, I vowed at that point in time to learn everything I could about our treatment laws and try to make them work better for families. A 5150, could you explain what that is? 5150 is um, a, an authority vested in law that allows law enforcement or clinical people designated by the county to take somebody into custody because they're dangerous, um, to maybe to themselves, dangerous to other people, or gravely disabled, so disabled that they can't take care of their own needs for food, clothing, and shelter. And so it's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a, something that we do to help people who can't help themselves. Well, there was a recent law that passed Senate Senate Bill, uh, Senate Bill forty three. It, it expands the definition of grave disability, and you've been working on that bill for how long before it finally passed? Senator Susan Eggman, who's champion of mental health issues. The the recommendation for the changes in that law go back to the nineties because we'd been seeing people falling through the cracks, even with the law as it is. 
it wasn't being interpreted correctly and it wasn't being interpreted consistently. And so the thought was, let's let's tighten that up and make sure that people don't fall through the cracks. We want them to get treatment and we couldn't. So, um, you know, we've we've had active legislation for three or four years. And finally, last year, we had SB 43. Yeah, which is huge. One of the first major reforms of Lanterman Petra Short, which has always been kind of the third rail of mental health policy in, in California. There's a lot of concern. If you could talk a little bit about concerns over quote unquote involuntary commitment, which is at the heart of Lanterman Petra Short. I mean, people in state hospitals were locked up. You know, they couldn't leave. Uh, women were sterilized. Uh, there were also some very good programs that were starved of funding. So that progression, could you describe? Yeah, these, these laws date back to the 60s and there were a lot of abuses. There are um, pictures online from Life magazine in the 50s showing people naked and shackled to brick walls, no clothing. Um, and that's what they did during the day. You know, later people would come in and they would hose things down. Uh, so we had laws like the LPS Act, which was passed in 1967, which is supposed to confer rights and protect people, but also give them opportunities for treatment when they didn't really even realize they needed that. And that's one aspect of it. In schizophrenia, about half of the people don't realize that they're sick. And if you're sick, why would you ask for or even accept help? And that's so often the case. And that's at the core of a lot of um, the work that we do um, in last year, we did pass a law that did make it um, uh, uh, more, more permissible to to consider a person's inability to take care of their health. You know, you see the poor, helpless, homeless person, they're bloody and they're on the street corner. Uh, they have a wound or maybe they suffer from things like diabetes or other things. And that's not reason enough to take them in just because they're neglecting their health. There wasn't until last year. So that's partly what the new law does. But your question is, you know, what is the controversy about this? And it's forced treatment to some people. Um, and a lot of people don't like that. I've heard, I've heard um, you know, the LPS law is referred to as preventive detention, you know, which is sounds bad but you know i think the one side of it that i i am firmly on is that we need to take care of people who are not able to take care of themselves and um that's what the, why the law exists and the, and the law has a lot of protections built in so that we can't sweep up um you know people who are just you know young teenagers who are rebellious and they go out and they smoke some dope and family doesn't feel like they could control them, you know, 70 years ago, you could conceivably get that type of person put in a state hospital, right? Families could do that. And protections were built into the law in 1967. And this is part of it is that most of these are judicially supervised commitments. So if you have a 5150 placed on, let's say somebody like my son, because he is um, actually how I got him into his first hospitalization is as I when they were not going to let him in as I noticed that he had burnt holes in the web between his index finger and uh, his thumb with a cigarette, so he had open open wounds there, and that was an example of uh, self harm. And um, we we only want to take care of people against their will when they don't take care of themselves. That's kind of the bottom line on the other side you know it's like you know maybe it could have been taken care of with you know some sort of voluntary service mm -hmm. maybe that would have taken care of him maybe he wouldn't have gotten as as sick as he is but keeping in mind the 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 real fundamental thing about schizophrenia is again 50 percent of the people don't realize they're sick and that's brain dysfunction it's not you know them just yeah you know you're crazy there's, there's a psychiatric term for it, which I can now pronounce, anosognosia, is that right? Anosognosia, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a, a, a term that's actually applied in all kinds of disciplines, not just psychiatry, and it means the inability to, to reflect and to be able to have insight into your condition. So people who lose a limb sometimes... You know, in orthopedics, uh, in orthopedic uh, treatment, there are cases where people still believe they've got that limb. You know, they lost a finger, a hand, uh, or whatever. 
And that's called anosognosia in, in orthopedics and in neurology and all kinds of stuff. So very, very valid um, uh, um, sort of condition. Proposition one was recently passed by voters, but by a very slim margin, despite polls not long before the March election that showed it easily passing. It's the centerpiece of the governor's mental health reforms, providing funding uh, for many already enacted programs and updating the 20-year-old Mental Health Services Act, the so-called millionaire's tax passed by voters as Proposition 63, which has raised billions for mental health services with but with many limitations and too little accountability. Why did you why do you think Proposition One passed by such a narrow margin? Um, what does that say about the pu public attitudes? You, you know, I'm not sure it's a big reflection on on mental health care. I mean, when when there have been polls like the Public Policy Institute of California polls, everybody's concerned about mental health. As a matter of fact, now it's OK for people in public to start talking about that. That's a real difference than when I started out. But what we're really talking about here is, you know, a very slim margin. I mean, 27 million uh, registered voters and the initiative passes by 27,000 votes, right? 50.2% wasn't 50. Can you still, can you hear us okay? Yeah. Okay, okay, 50.2%. Well, 50. Yeah. yeah, it's like, wow, that's a squeaker. And we just thought because it pulls so well with people, people really want mental health care. They want the people who are mentally ill on the street and homeless taken care of. And they want want it now, right? Um, and we're I'm I mean I'm tired of driving downtown and seeing the encampments, right? And a lot of those people are mentally ill. So, um, so what's what's behind that? Um, some of it is the timing. Um, this is a congress, you know, a presidential election year, and and in this you know uh, election that we just had. We're talking about people who really, really want to sh stand up, show up, and make their votes count for their their candidate of choice. But in uh, elections that aren't um, um, the full election, where your 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 individual is up there for a vote, and they're, we're still deciding on candidates at the at the level of this kind of election, they. The, the people who show up tend to be more conservative. Um, and one of the issues was this is going to cost money. At least that was a talking point. It's going to cost money, going to raise your taxes, which it won't. Um, but that was one of the arguments. The other was, you know, um, we're going to lose services over here if we focus it over here. So let me just tell you a little bit about Prop 1. Uh, Prop 1 redirects money for people who are more severely mentally ill. Right. So um, you're not going to find drum circles or equine therapy or, you know, any any yoga or any of a number of th things um, no longer will be supported by the funds that come from this particular tax. And it's a one percent tax on income over a million dollars. So I'm sure a lot of people here have have absolutely um, uh, no interest in, in in who it taxes because it doesn't tax you, right? Because you don't make a million dollars a year. But it's about the people who showed up to vote and the timing, you know, this is a primary election and it causing uh, conservative older people who are concerned about funding and thought there might be a tax involved. I think that says a lot of it. Um, you know, the, there was a lot of other thinking that went into it, but at the end of the day, um, the governor didn't, you know, I think he he assumed that it would do better than it did. And he didn't push it as hard as he could. So mm -hmm. in case he's listening out there, apologies, governor, but, um, you know, maybe a few more ads, uh, maybe a few more, um, you know, attempts to outreach to community members to help them understand. Do you think, do you think also it's a result of, I mean, there's been a lot of money spent on mental health and homelessness. I mean, what is it, 29 billion uh, with from Prop 63? which has not always been well spent and not it's not accountable. Uh, data collection is, mm -hmm. is poor. People see that and think, wait, you know, why are we spending more money on it? Right. 
Yeah. I mean, it, if your tax dollars are going to the government and the government is saying, we'll take care of this problem, and then you still see it on the street, what are you going to do? You're going to say, government's not doing a really good job. And the fact is that we don't have outcome data. We don't have anything to show what the money has been spent on. I mean, you can go find individual records in individual counties, but you know, at the end of the day, I, I sat on the steering committee for Prop 63 and I said, the sheriffs will tell us if we're successful because their census in the jails is sky high, right? People with mental illness, one of the ways they get treatment is get arrested because on the streets, they're not being treated, at least now. And so the sheriffs would tell us and they, they, and, you know, contrary to expectations with all this money flowing, they're saying, you know, it's worse. So something's wrong. And the data is not there to tell us exactly what, but a lot of us have a feeling uh, that it's the issue of accountability at the local level. It's like, you know, you got the state, you got counties, um, who's in charge. Um, and counties will tell you they are, and the state will tell you they are. And you'll say, okay, show me the data. Show me something that says we know what we're doing and we know how we're doing it. We know how to improve things. And it's not there. That's one of the things Prop 1 well, the, will change. The author of Prop 63 was Daryl Steinberg, now the mayor of Sacramento, and he was then Senate president pro tem. And he has an institute, the Steinberg Institute, which recently released a report, no surprises really, about incarceration and mental health. And the percentages, and these percentages are notoriously um, undercounted, uh, are, you know, 50% of people in county jails are uh, have mental health issues. And they don't have the facilities or the, you know, ability to treat it and are not spending much money on that. That was one of the criticisms in the, the report um, from the Steinberg Institute. What is the connection between incarceration and mental health is huge. It is, it is. And the policy implications, how, how, how do you deal with that in terms of, of policy? Well, uh, back in 1999, um, we we actually got behind a measure that was a mentally ill offenders, crim, you know, Criminal Justice Act um, grant program. And because we'd had 30 years since the state hospitals closed down mm -hmm. to observe that when you release people into the community and there's not sufficient um, uh, services of the right kind for those individuals, then one of three things happens. Um, they go into jails and, and prisons because they're picked up on petty crime charges or they become homeless or often they're at home with their parents living in a back bedroom and the parents are tearing their hair out because they're psychotic, they refuse treatment and they're really hard to manage. So the, the criminal justice connection has been clear. A few years after Ronald Reagan shut down most of the state hospitals, um, we started noticing people showing up in prisons and, and jails. Uh, there's a, a paper from 1972 uh, about a psychiatrist's experience and with a new population that was showing up, showing up in the San Mateo County Jail. And it was the severely mentally ill. There was no other place to put them. Sometimes there were mercy arrests, not just that they were arrested for certain charges and therefore they were put in jail. But it's like, what do we do with these people? Well, let's arrest them. At least they'll be safe. They'll, they'll be given food and there, there's be a roof over their head and maybe we can get them some treatment in the jail. So that is a sad history that we have right now. But And there have been, you know, successful mental health courts. Sacramento County has one. There's, you know, a, a very... Uh, a very fine program in Santa Clara County, which is kind of the gold standard for the country. There are drug diversion programs, but that's on the criminal justice side, yeah. which is after someone has been yeah. arrested. Yeah. So the new legislation and Prop 1, uh, you know, require it, it, that it be dealt with on the civil side. The yeah. CARE Court, we haven't yeah. talked yeah. about yeah. the CARE Act, which was passed in the last year, right? And right. now it is being implemented 
statewide. That was another of Newsom's in initiatives and Senator Eggman. Yes. Uh, and Senator Umberg. Um, yeah. And these will be specific courts set up for the mentally ill. And uh, again, you have a lot of resistance from uh, from counties and also from disability rights rights groups. Correct. Where, what is the status of the CARE Act now? Well, fortunately, it gives you an alternative to telling your your loved one who's psychotic and not accepting medication to throw a brick through a window so you can get treatment, right? So it changes that paradigm, puts it on its head. Instead of criminal courts, you got civil courts. And anybody here who knows somebody who looks like they have a psychosis, which means they're hearing and seeing things that the rest of us don't see. And they also have delusions, like they're the long lost son of um, Elton John or you know, some, you know, know, some the FBI are chasing them. Those kind of people can be referred in a petition. You, as individual citizens, can actually petition a court and say, I think this person needs to be at the very least evaluated because they seem to be in such desperate straits. And so the courts, this is a new court set up. It's uh, in seven pilot counties right now. It'll be in all 58 counties by December. Um, and, and it allows a petition from citizens. And then there's uh, a court supervised evaluation. And that's important because courts can actually hold local treatment and social service agencies accountable. You know, this person's come to my court. There's been a petition. I need the county here. We're going to have a hearing. We're going to decide whether or not treatment in this court is in the best interest of the individual. And then the court can say, yeah, you meet criteria. And they can say to the county, bring me back a treatment plan. So it's the it's the involvement of the court, which gives many of us hope that this will actually, actually work. Because there's so many reasons why... Uh, counties, you know, end up letting people who are severely mentally ill and homeless or whatever um, fall through the cracks. And the courts can help prevent that. It's called the black robe effect often. And often these are voluntary, um, these arrangements. They, their involuntary commitment is not is not necessary. Um, the goal is obviously still is always treatment not incarceration. Um, and there are many people in the disability community. I've interviewed many um, people who have severe mental illness who said without involuntary commitment, they would be dead. The, you know, they're still a, not a lo as loud as the, as the disability rights yeah. community. And there are legitimate concerns. I mean, I saw abuses in the state hospitals and, um, you know, the community care that was supposed to be included as a result of Lannerman Petrus York. That never really happened. Why why was that? Well it actually goes back to even earlier, Lannerman Petrus Short Act, the the kind of the civil rights, the Magna Carta for people who are mentally ill, if you will, uh, was 1967. But back in 1962, John F. Kennedy had a had a dream, right? You know, um he was familiar with mental disabilities from his family experience. And um, he decided he was going to set up the Community uh, Mental Health Care Act. Thousand clinics funded by Congress were initiated, passed, and signed by John F. Kennedy. Um, ultimately, as some as often happens, um, only about three or four hundred of these clinics did get funding and did get set up. So the resources were kind of stolen. The rug was kind of pulled out from under the initiative. And so it didn't work to its full extent. So we didn't really have the resources in the community, which is why we see people, you know, in prison, why we see them homeless on the streets. We've never really put our, um, our resources out there where the problem is the worst. And this is one of the things about Prop 1 that I kind of like is that it focuses, it refocuses all of these different programming strands that exist in community health right now on the most severely mentally ill. Yeah. Well, there's some criticism of the CARE Act because of the language. And I understand there are efforts in the le legislature to um, clarify that, but um, it applies to severely mentally ill people, schizophrenia 
primarily and related psychotic disorders. There are other psychiatric disorders, bipolar disorder, for example, that have have uh, psychotic features. And so there's a concern that, you know, the net is not being cast wide enough. Maybe that's a bad analogy, but um, that they need programs for people, not not only schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is very serious. How do you think the language of that can be improved to include more people who will need that treatment? Well, I think that, you know, it's a matter of establishing first that the program works in the pilot pilot um, locations around the state, so seven counties. But I, I think that it's, it, anybody who works in community mental health will tell you that somebody who is bipolar doesn't realize it, they're psychotic and they're on a manic tear, is capable of doing a lot of damage to themselves and to other people. They will engage in all kinds of risky behavior. So why not, when the person is really basically in, captivated by an illness and doesn't realize it, you know, who cares if it's bipolar or schizophrenia? I mean, that's my attitude. It's more practical, but legally um, that needs to be built into the CARE Act where it is not now. So if you have bipolar disorder of that certain type, you're excluded. Um, so it's being looked at. It's it's something we're conscious of working with legislators, not this year, but maybe next. We want to see the full program come online and then We'll start making tweaks to it as they become evident, you know, statewide. Well, this year we also have a major deficit in the state budget, so that makes new legislation more more difficult. Um, could you talk a little bit about the role of the counties? I mean, mental health care is delivered at the county level, and the, all the money is state and federal primarily, and the counties te have tended to be resistant to reform. How would you characterize that they've well i don't think you need to put too fine a point on it we have a real issue with our counties um they think that they're they're the experts and if something is passed that they don't agree with then they drag their feet okay and i'll just say that you know i i am i am not loved by our county partners because we brought yet another bill this year um simply because they take too long they do too little and uh don't produce the results from There's my some, point of some view, counties that do. Some, some of them, I mean, you will find exemplary programs. We have very smart, dedicated people who are out there in pockets within the state, and they will show the rest of everybody how to do it. But unfortunately, one county um, doesn't have to emulate what another county is doing, even if it's showing the very, very best outcomes right? Your people are getting out of jail and they're getting to live in the community and they've got job programs. And they, I mean, for people with schizophrenia, that's amazing. And, and, it's, and it is achieved uh, in some places. So what is the role of the County Behavioral Health Directors Association in this? They, that's the association, the advocacy association for the County Behavioral Health um, Programs. And they have... Uh, reportedly resisted many of the new reforms that we're not ready. We don't have the facilities and the lack of facilities. That's certainly true. Yeah. But what, how would you characterize their? Well, I'll just tell you a quick little story. Um, when we were drafting AB uh, 43, which, sorry, SB 43, which is the grave disability change that includes being able to consider um, their inability to take care of a medical condition or their safety in the community. Also, whether they're drug using and greatly disabled by that. Um, the counties, you know, came to us and said, you know, we don't like your bill. And so we said, well, okay, help us change it. We don't want to lose, you know, the focus of the bill, what we're trying to do. But if you've got ideas, bring them on, bring them up. And um, they never showed up for the meeting. So that'd be one thing. And, you know, the other is that then after we passed our legislation, pretty much without our their help, and they kept saying, well, we're the experts and we weren't listened to. And it was kind of like sour grapes. It's kind of like, okay, you can't get behind this. Um, we really want the counties to do better, but they don't want to be told what to do. And that's a real impasse. Um, we have to deal with the uh, collective mental health directors who think that nothing, you know, should be passed, you know, nothing without us, right? And uh, sometimes 
you just need to say, I'm, I'm really sorry, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that you don't want to implement things like Laura's Law um, and Care Corp. I mean, they were not big fans of Care Corp. They were not big fans of Prop 1. You know, it's kind of like, what are you big fans of, right? Your mission is to treat and treat well and 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 put people on their feet and put them back in the community stable. Um, so we, we'll have a kind of an attitude problem from my perspective. As I said, you know, I say stuff like this regularly and the counties don't tend to like it a lot, but, you know, somebody has to speak truth to what's the saying to speak truth to power. Well, you mentioned Laura's Law. I don't know how many people are familiar with Laura's Law. It was passed in, what, 2002? Uh, Helen Thompson in the Assembly, who was a, is a former psychiatric uh, nurse uh, married to a psychiatrist. Uh, she was vilified as Nurse Ratchet. There were demonstrations at the Capitol. It was a response. Why don't tell us about Laura's Law and what it was in response response to? Because you were very involved in. Yeah, I worked on trying to implement that for twenty years, and the impetus was, um, you know, we need ways of not just putting people in in inpatient hospitals against their will and treating them. When we when we when we can, we want to treat people in. The least restrictive setting is the kind of the buzzword. And that means that if there could be a community program that could take somebody who's just about to crater, right? You know, their their behavior is getting worse. They're going to be in real big trouble if it keeps going. We found that assisted outpatient treatment model um, in New York in 1999. And they developed a program where people could be committed, right? bad word, but it's, you know, kind of describes what it is, but they're committed to go home at night to their own beds. It's an outpatient commitment. It's not inpatient. So we passed the law. Um, and Laura's, Laura was actually a student in Nevada County who one summer was volunteering behind the reception desk at Behavioral Health Department headquarters and was shot and killed by Scott Thorpe. Scott Thorpe was off his meds. He was dangerous. That danger had been reported. Everybody said, can't do anything about it. You know, we don't see it when we come up and talk to him. It's like, but the doctor says, but I know I can guarantee you he's dangerous. So Laura's law was developed in response to uh, situations like that, where a person was approaching danger, approaching grave disability, approaching harming themselves in some way. And you could intervene before it got to that point. And you could intervene before it got to the point where you needed to put him in the hospital. And his family was supportive of this. There were two other people killed and, and there were a couple of other people yeah. injured in that attack. And um, the family had been warning the Nevada County uh, Mental Health Department that he, their family member, his brother was a police officer, police detective with the Sacramento Police Department. And yeah. he said, you know, my brother is off his meds. He needs help. And and he eventually, they eventually did file suit, I think, against yeah. the, the Wilcox family filed the Wilcox. suit, not the Thorpe Wilcox. family. But Thorpe. they worked together on, on Laura's Law. Yeah. It's unusual. Yeah. yeah. So Laura's Law was meant to, to meet a specific need. Um, and it doesn't mean it has to be that kind of dramatic danger, but it does mean that somebody is there and they're either deteriorating or it's clear they will deteriorate. And they have a history where you know what's going to happen next if somebody doesn't intervene, mm -hmm. right? They are going to be the person who gets in real trouble and they're going to either with other people or, or just inside themselves. So um, we have a process that allow, again allows a petition to a court. And this, again, is a civil court. It's not criminal court um, where, the, where the judge can say, OK, I've, I've, I've received reports. And, and it looks like uh, you're off your meds and you're kind of sampling some of the street drugs and you just lost your housing. Uh, what do you think we could do about that together? Right. You can get a petition, bring the person in and the judge establishes a dialogue. And this is meant to be use of the black robe effect, um, you know, where the judge is probably not sitting there in a black robe, but they're in a courtroom and it's pretty intimidating and people tend to listen and pay attention if you say the judge wants to talk to you, right? You need to have a conversation with the judge about what's going on in your life. 
So that's sort of the power and the rationale and sort of how Laura's Law works. And it's been successful. There hasn't been good data collection and the counties were not required to implement Laura's Law. It was strengthened at one point a few years ago by the Susan Eggman legislation and uh, to require the counties to have public hearings before they opted out. It used to be they could just not and just not do it. And most of them didn't didn't have Laura, Laura's Law program. It's called assisted outpatient treatment, treatment. Uh, on a national level. And there are a lot of studies so showing that it's very effective when implemented properly. Um, how does the CARE Act, the CARE Court, affect um, Laura's Law? Because it, they're both a civil court process. Yeah, the CARE Act was designed um, taking into account uh, some of the perceived failures of assisted outpatient treatment. And what I mean by that is um, with it, it being an option for counties, we didn't have many counties for at first who wanted to do it. Um, even though we could point to New York, we could point to Duke University studies saying, this is good stuff. This will really help. And counties are going, we got too many other things. We're not concerned about that. So they didn't want to do it. So we made it, you know, we turned, we switched that switch and made, made counties say, okay, well, you know, the state's saying you have to do it, but you can opt out. And if you're going to opt out, you stand up in front of your community stakeholders and you tell them why. Tell them why you're not going to do an effective program. So we still only got 31 counties at the end of that. 80% of the pop eighty percent of the population. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we learned a lot from the 20 years we've spent trying to get Laura's Law implemented. And so a lot of that learning went into the shaping of the care court. And uh, some of that is that really put teeth into it, uh, where judges can actually call counties into account. So they can actually um, fine a county now. That's that's never existed in mental health law. Judge can say, you're really you know, pissing me off because we've, we've been here for six months. Of course, he might not say that exactly that right. way, but might be thinking it. Um, and it's kind of like, okay, I've given you so many opportunities. We need housing. The treatment plan calls for drug treatment. The treatment plan calls for, and you failed to provide that. I'm going to find you. And, and I'm at the very least, I'm going to call, have, I'm going to issue a pickup order if you don't show up in court and you have to come talk to me while you haven't been able to do this. And ultimately the care court act actually puts uh, counties in the spotlight and the programs that are supposed to do the work, if they're not doing the work, the court can put them in receivership, which means the court takes control over the programs themselves. So you can see why I say it now. We, we've we learned our lesson from Laura's law and its lack of implementation. And we designed a new law that should be Laura's law or AOT on steroids because hmm. it has accountability features built in. That's what I call accountability. When a court can, can summon a, a public official and say, please explain to me why you're not treating Joe. Why, why his treatment plan's been here for six months, but I don't see any progress. So if on the accountability uh, end of this, that's been one of the big problems, certainly in covering this area, getting good data, you know, the availability of data. The new laws have a, a strong accountability factor and data collection uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we should open it up to questions. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Do you have right. anything? I, I know there's, this is a huge area. It's very complex. It's easy to just kind of say, well, there I saw, are no yeah, solutions. Yeah, but, we're uh, in the red. Uh, okay, place. I'm going to, which you have yeah. under the good mic. Okay, all right. Pass this one. Uh, just be sure to speak into it. So two questions. The first is, I think that it's important to address the lack of funding for the counties. I, I've watched over the years, the bar gets higher and higher to commit somebody based on less and less resources. And I, 
I also wonder if that is the same factor when someone calls a police officer and says, hey, my, my kid or my relative needs to be committed and the police come out and say, oh, well, you know, if they're not cutting themselves in front of me, we're not going to do anything about it. And we have some pretty tragic cases here where particularly one where the police were called three times and the man ended up injuring a police dog and was shot running across a freeway. So I was hoping you could address those two. So, well, okay, about resources. Um, so the, the fact is that resources have been more increasingly available, uh, more so. This governor, more than any governor in our history, has uh, put money into uh, programming. So if the police say, you know, I'm not really going to do much with this guy because I know there's, you know, I'm going to see him on the streets in two hours if I take him to the treatment center, right? And then the treatment center says, okay, well, we'll take him, but then we don't have anything, to, no place to put him after we release him. Some of that is starting to change because there are, you know, grants that have gone out in the last two two years of nearly $5 billion for counties to be able to utilize money to build more treatment facilities. Prop 1 will also help because it acknowledges not only our, you know, it, there's a bond in that, um, the $6.38 billion that will help build not only more psychiatric beds or alcohol and treatment beds, but board and cares, places for people to live in the community. So some of that's going to be alleviated by both, you know, programming that's already on board and stuff that'll come because of Prop 1. So the resource issue, you know, is, is more complex than just that. Um, there's a new mental behavioral health benefit in the new Medi-Cal system. It's called Cal. -Cal Oh, whatever. Cal-A. I was going to call it cal -Mend, and that was <laughs> something from another part of my past. But it it leaves, um, you know, fewer and fewer um, excuses on the table by putting more and more dollars out there. So you can get a crisis response um, team set up in your county, and they can respond instead of the police. And then that team can actually get um, re reimbursed for the, the time they spent um, traveling and talking and uh, maybe arranging arranging care or at least talking somebody down, doing a risk assessment, whatever they do in the community, some of that will be now covered. Um, so there's a lot of, of those kinds of features that are coming on board that make me feel hopeful. And that was the resource issue. What was the other one? Got it. Okay. We've done a lot to try to, we know we have a problem with our police officers. It's like they show up, somebody just doing something really weird and they say, stop that. And the person doesn't do it. And then they go, okay, he's flouting my authority, right? I've got the badge. I've got the gun. You don't. So do it. And people in psychosis are going, who are you? Are you the, my fairy godmother? You know? And, and so it, it doesn't really work unless the police are trained because they're the first responders. Uh, we've done a lot to train them. We mandated more training hours. Uh, we have election of some to go to a CIT Academy to get, you know, 20, 30, 40 hours of instruction and be special officers. But at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're shifting the model where t police are not always expected to be the ones who show up for a, a mental health issue in the community when it's identified as such. So we were moving towards a, a space where we have mental health clinicians. Sometimes they work directly with the police. Sometimes they just are dispatched when it seems safe to send, you know, a social worker on a call. And so that should help us because as you said, you know, the outcome of that was a death and it didn't need it. We know how to do better and we're trying to do that. And I think we're making some progress. A question related to the care courts. How are the judges for the care courts identified and what is their background and expertise in terms of handling these kinds of cases? Excellent question. We've had collaborative court care in California since the early 90s, right? So there's always, there's been judges like Anthony in Santa Clara County, who's like the godfather of drug and alcohol and mental health and veterans and women's courts. Um, and so 
they talk to each other, they share, they're on committees at the Judicial Council. So we know who some, the interested judges are and they do get some training. Um, uh, Sigrid mentioned that I was um, on the Treatment Advocacy Center board and the Treatment Advocacy Center actually came out from Washington and did a training for judges and then for judges and their community partners. Um, and so we know that there are people and most of these judges are volunteers. They do it because they want to make a difference in this particular way. So you've got some training, uh, you've got a cadre of older judges who are mentoring and you've got uh, people who are stepping up saying, seems like something where I'd feel really good going home at night if I could do that during the day. So um, not a not a robust, um, stratified, precise selection process, but it more natural and organic. Hi, um, another resource kind of related question. You made reference to the state hospital closures uh, back in the Reagan era, mm -hmm. but when I try to look that up, uh, it, like there's a lot of conflicting information at, at best vague uh, about how extensive it was. Do you know how many hospitals were closed, what the population was versus, you, you know, know what exists today and, 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 and what, where, where, where are the numbers on that? You know, are there, are there the, the homeless population, is it equal or where are we at? Or are they, we just going to keep putting them in jail or, you know? Um, okay. So the first question is what, 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 what was really going on, right? What are the numbers um, to the best of my recollection? Um, you know, we had about 32 uh, state hospitals. Maybe it was 28, but somewhere in that range, right? So, you know, there was uh, DeWitt up in Auburn. It's been closed and it's been turned into, you know, whatever it's been turned into. You know, the there is the Sonoma Developmental Center now, which used to be a state hospital, and we've got five left. Actually, a Tascadero I would put in its own category for reasons that I won't really explain right now, but we've got four left out of that group, right? And so, we have approximately 7,000 people in those four hospitals right now. The census back then was well north of 30,000. There's 35,000 or so individuals. So the loss of the attrition dumped a lot of those people into the community. And, you know, we couldn't, you couldn't send them back if they got into trouble, right? So most of the state hospitals most of the state hospitals now are for the criminally insane and there's a huge backlog of people in jails and 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 in prisons who need treatment or a court has ordered them for treatment but there's there's nowhere for them to go and one thing we haven't talked about is the developmentally disabled population in the um, state hospitals, which was significant. Uh, and back in the day, it was, they were called I mean, mentally retarded. My first coverage area was at Stockton State Hospital, which was all developmentally disabled, a lot of children. And um, there was a system set up, the regional center system. Could you talk about that? Well, um, not very well. But um, the, the fact is that there was a system, a parallel system set up for the, the DD population. And um, somehow they got an entitlement to care and mentally ill people didn't. What that means is that if you need it, you get it, right? In an entitlement, it's like whatever we need to do to take care of that individual. So that's a difference in the two systems is that um, mental health care in our state is provided to the extent that funding is available. So funding goes down, less services. Funding mm -hmm. goes up, maybe more services. Um, so two, it's a really unequal and it's a very disappointing kind of setup. But there are community, faci community facilities for developmentally disabled people to go to, which are, you know, through this, this regional center system, there are regional centers around the state. That's often cited as possibly um, being used as a model. Yeah, I would like to get there. I mean, if you if you say that the state and the county and the feds are just on the hook for paying for whatever it takes, right, for an individual, that's the kind of system that we want. Because these, these are intractable, real serious illnesses. Schizophrenia is a really, really serious um, dysfunction of the brain. 
Um, and if we can't take care of them and we can't give people what we know they need, and by the way, we know what to do. The hard part is getting it done, right? The implementation is 90% of all the policy work that I do. Laura's law took, you know, close to 20 years to get it more fully implemented. Um, and then it was probably going to take the rest of my career to make sure it's working really well in each of those settings. So Yes, we have a couple of uh, questions from our Zoom audience. By the way, there are 40 people that were logged in to share this experience with you. Uh, the first one comes from Len Merowitz, and uh, he says, as a former member of the County Mental Health Board, I saw how county behavior health directors and county supervisors are influenced by advocates who see severely mentally ill people as needing most to have their civil rights protected. They define this as protecting SMI from involuntary treatment. They don't seem to understand or want to believe that SMI are ill and their illness is what is depriving them of their civil rights and treatment might help them regain their civil rights. Would you like to comment on that? Yes. The you know, severely mentally ill SMI. Um, as I said earlier, you know, people who don't know they're sick are hardly able of exercising you know, their constitutional rights in a conscious way. Um, and there is there are those who believe that the most important thing about the structure of our current treatment system is that we protect their rights. And there's others, including me, who say the most important thing we need to establish is their right to treatment make them well, then send them off with their rights intact. But until then, you know, it's a, it's a sham um, to say that their mental health rights are more important than their recovery. And if it has to happen in a hospital, it has to happen in a hospital. If it doesn't, that's fine too. But we need to do whatever it takes. We have a question from Ann Mitchell who asks, what funds will be made available by Prop 1 to train mental health care providers. My understanding is lack of mental health workers is one of the huge issues. Okay, really quickly. Um, there are other funds that have been put online and by online, I mean made available by the state in the last two years to train social workers and psychiatrists and, and new, n provide new, new, I want to say new numbers, but more numbers of people uh, in both of those categories. In Prop 1, there's also a set aside that the state will administer that's, I think, 5% of the state funds that come to the state out of the proposition, and they will be put aside for workforce development. So counties um, can kind of say, hey, well, look, well, we need, we don't really need as many uh, social workers, but we sure could use a couple of psychiatrists, and they, the state will, you know, kind of dicker with them and figure out how to get money, um, you know, to training programs or a train a new newly trained person into, you know, those kind of areas and they'll have money to do it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Let's please have, have a great hand for our, our presenter and for Sigrid for doing a wonderful job of, with this interview. So in, as a token of our appreciation, Randall, we offer you a one-year membership in our Renaissance Society. We hope you will find that valuable. And we will also make a contribution uh, to the Seth Nelson Emergency Cares Fund in your name, in your oh, honor. Well.